This is Gary Contessa with Capital OTP, practicing social distancing with Richard Migliori, who we just measured off six feet. <laughs> and uh, I'm really happy to have Richard here today because uh, I know Richard since I'm new in the game. He and I came in at about the same time. And Richard's story is one of the most interesting stories of all. So I'm going to turn this over to Rich. Rich, tell us about coming up in New York, the trials and tribulations of making it through your apprentice season, and then the hardest step, and we see so many jockeys fail at this, the transition from apprentice jockey to journeyman. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it, it is a very tough transition, um, but I was very fortunate. I hooked on with Steve DeMauro, uh Sr., who put me under contract when I was 14 years old. And they really groomed me to be a rider. And by the time I was 16, I was probably ready to ride for six months already. And they started me, and I had an exceptional apprentice year in 1981. Was leading rider in New York for the year as an apprentice, which you, know, you think about, it wasn't that far removed from when I was galloping horses, watching guys like Angel Cordero, George Velasquez, and now I'm competing with them. So I had a wonderful bug year. Actually lost my apprentice allowance when I was in Tokyo, Japan, to ride the very first Japan Cup, I finished third on the very one. Came back to New York, and things kind of kept rolling along. The original plan was for me to stay in New York for the winter, uh, and then Steve wanted me to come to Florida to ride the horses. So I went to Florida and wound up hitting that post-apprentice slump that everybody talks about. Um, you know, a lot of people that ride you because you do get the incentive of five pounds off, well, suddenly, you know, you don't have as much experience as some of the guys. And you think about the jockey's room back then, Gary, as you know, Angel Cordero, George Velasquez, Jacinto Vasquez, Eddie Maple. I, I mean, just one Hall of Famer after another. Um, I wound up buying my contract uh, in April of 82. So that kind of also spiraled. Now I lost the support of that main stable. Uh, felt like I needed to kind of freelance, so get out on my own a little bit. And I struggled. I, I struggled mightily for two years. 82 and 83 were slow. 83 was slower than 82. I, I think what happens too is a lot of guys don't hang in there. And it was maybe a little bit easier for me to hang in there because I'm from New York. I wasn't like, you know, a lot of guys come here from other places and if they're not doing good, they get homesick and they go, well, I'll just go home. I was home, so I was going to dig in, and I, I toyed with the idea of going to a couple of different places to try to kickstart my career, but at the end of the day, I was home, and I kept seeing light at the end of the tunnel. I was working. Um, I, I'm a true believer in you have to look at the man in the mirror, and what was I doing to create that success, or what wasn't I doing that I should be doing to create that success? And I just started hitting the barn area, you know, 5.30 every morning, and I decided I don't know when I'm going to get the opportunity, but I'm going to do everything I can to make it happen, and I'm going to be ready for the opportunity when it comes. And that's really all you can do. You can't make someone ride you, but when you get that shot, you got to make the most of it. And 84, I started picking up. And middle of 84, um, had a pretty good Saratoga. Mark Cassie was training in New York then. I was riding all his horses. And a horse named Wild again came open in the Meadowlands Cup. He needed a rider. It was grade one on Labor Day. And that was when we used to be out of here by Labor Day, out of Saratoga. And my agent called Vincent Timphony, the trainer of Wild again. And he said, you know, this kid's riding good. You might want to keep an eye on him. He says, well, I'll watch him ride today. Does he have many mounts today? I think I was on four or five horses. Well, I won three that day and the stake. I won the Boojum on a horse named Tarantara for Pete Ferriola. And I won three. He called up my agent and says, he can ride wild again. I have to ride the first race for Mark Cassie, a good filly named Kamikaze Rick. She won off the screen. Remember her well. Yeah, good, very fast filly. Oh, yes. Jumped in the helicopter, go over the Meadowlands. He goes wire to wire, win a $500,000 grade one, first race. And that's what kind of uplifted me. And I was leading rider in 81. And then 85, I was leading rider again as a journeyman. Um, and, and you know, so it was a big deal. But again, I think what happens is a lot of guys don't hang in there through that tough part. And maybe in some respects it was easier for me because again, I was home. Right. And you know, many jockeys over the years have come to me and said, 
Gary, how, you know, I'm going to lose my bug. What do you suggest? And so many of them, when they lose the bug, they think they need to go to Parks or Penn National or Laurel and restart as a journeyman. In my opinion, that hurts you because yeah. those people didn't have that luxury of you being a bug. They don't know anything about you. And now suddenly you're going to launch a journeyman career in another track. I think that's probably the common denominator to failure is to leave where you made your bones and where you made your roots. And it's just so hard to get back to, to you know, you're in New York. That's where you want to be. New York or California at that time were the two places that basically were the major league circuits. If you leave, how do you get back? And that was something that I always thought about. If I leave, though, how am I going to get back here? And I just decided I was going to dig in and, and work and so, it paid off. Amazing. Wild again, great racehorse, went on to a good stud career. Yep made also made Richard Migliori which even I didn't know because let's face it you win your first grade one people notice people notice you on what you do in this game nobody knows who ran second in the Kentucky Derby because nobody no. um, people only take note of who won and so that that horse made your your journeyman career d at least jump started it and now your career is starting to really pick up Tell us some of your, your most memorable moments as a journeyman. I think, I, I know there's been many, and there's been many in my team, even my horses, but tell me your most memorable times. Well, you know, it's interesting because Wild Again really did put me in a different light in trainers' eyes. And I started picking up some really nice horses. I picked up a horse named Wynn, uh, first New York bred to er ever earn a million dollars, and Paul Cornman, who owned him, saw me win the Meadowlands Cup and he formulated this idea that I'd be a good fit for win. So I won the Man of War on him, beat Cozine right here in Saratoga in the Bernard Baruch. Picked up a horse late in the winter at Aqueduct named Eternal Prince. Now you gotta understand, I grew up in Brooklyn about 12 miles from Aqueduct. My whole life going to the track with my father, I would go to that wind picture wall, the Wood Memorial wind pictures. Since I'm a little kid and just study them and I could tell you all the winners and the great riders. So I, I pick up this horse, Eternal Prince. He wins the Gotham. He wins the Wood Memorial. And I, you know, I'm 20 years old now. He, he just won the Wood Memorial. And I'm walking in the winner's circle and it struck me that I was going to be on that wall that I stared at since I'm eight years old. And I actually got emotional about it because it was like a big deal. You know, I'm a New York guy. The Wood Memorial is a, 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 a big deal, especially then, you know, it was a grade one. Um, so, you know, those were the, those are the kind of memories that stand out to me, things that happened that had more meaning to me because of being a native New Yorker. Right. I, I never passed that wall without studying it. And even, and at Belmont, the Belmont wall, I find it amazing. The people that are in the pictures, the people that are, that are, you know, gravitate to those races and it was just an amazing thing and I've done the same thing as you study those pictures because it's just an incredible thing well it's part of our history and I really believe that if we don't embrace our history we're not going to make our future as good as it, as it can be you know our, our game is so great and a lot of it is because of the history of it you feel it in Saratoga it's easy to feel it here you know the Racing Museum and Hall of Fame across the street this incredible facility um, you know, I used to come here a lot in the off season and feel the ghosts of racing pass. You know, it's, um, we're, we're really fortunate. You know, I think anybody that's been a lifelong racetracker like us, you're a bit of a romantic, you, you know, so you embrace these kind of uh, historical ideals, if you will. We do. We yeah. do. And getting back to win, was that Sally Bailey? It was Sally Bailey. And that was an amazing situation because back then we didn't have very many women in this game no. and sally bailey brought that horse won a ton of stake races and amazingly with you and well what was interesting too though is um she was very fair and she sold half the horse to paul corman he had controlling interest but she still trained him and tony grail had been riding the horse and as a two-year-old he was a rogue I mean, really bad active, very bad in the gate. He was always kind of bad in the gate, but nobody really wanted to ride him. And then he hit the turf and he started running these lights out races. He ran second to John Henry. And Paul Corman wanted to put me on the horse. And Sally, and rightfully so, said, wait, this guy's been riding the horse when no one wanted to ride him. 
Now he's a good horse. Now you want to, you know, and she didn't want to change. And basically, Paul held her feet to the fire. And now I've got to go out and work the horse, and she's not happy. I mean, she won't even hardly talk to me. Uh, and then I go to ride him the first time, and it was an allowance race, mile and three-eighths on the grass, coming off a layoff, because she was incredible that way. She could get a horse ready yes, off a long layoff. Yes, I remember. Layoff. She was. And she said to me, don't make too much use of my horse. You win by as little as possible. So now you're riding a horse that's one to nine in an allowance race, right? And you got to measure it. And he was a tricky horse because he'd pull up. So you couldn't like be overconfident because he put his toes in the ground. And I wound up winning by a length. And believe me, I was, my stomach was in knots, right? But he, he won easy by a length. Came up here, won the Bernard Baruch. And I was fighting for lead and rider that meet here. And I, I shut Robbie Davis off, and I did it on purpose, and I deserved the days. He tried to come through a spot, and I slammed the gate. And so that morning, everybody's like, you got to appeal. You, gotta, you can't take your days. You, know, you and Angel are fighting for lead and rider. And I go by Sally's barn, big mistake. And she said, I saw what you did yesterday. You're going to get days. She said, if you appeal those days and can't ride this horse in the fall, you'll never ride him again. So now I go to the stewards and they say, well, we got to give you days. And I, that's weighing on me. My agent said, ah, we, we're not a little light the last week. I talked to Ron Turcott that morning, who I idolized. Joe Shea had been my first agent, had been Ron's agent his whole career. And he said, well, do you deserve the days? And I said, yeah. He goes, so what's the question? You got to take them. So I have all this. And the steward said, OK, you, you're going to appeal, right? And they handed me the paper to sign. I said, no, no, I'm taking them. And they were in shock. And we were tied 14 winners apiece when it was a 24-day meet with six racing days left, I go out that afternoon, I win four, Angel gets shut out, I'm winning 18-14 with five racing days left, and I can't ride because I can't, I can't now appeal. He beat me one winner. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And there was another year where you almost beat Angel Cordero as well, and you got sidelined with an injury. That was as an apprentice. I'd have been the only apprentice to win up here, and uh, I got hurt. It was an interesting circumstance. It was the last Saturday, so we got Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I'm on eight races Saturday, Gary, and I said my worst mount is the first race. That horse wins and pays 60 some odd dollars. So now we're tied, me and Angel, like 20 wins apiece. The second race, George Velasquez fell. And before Dawn was the, the favorite in the spinaway for Calumet. And Georgie went to the hospital, and John Beach comes in and he goes, Put the kid on the horse. I just picked up before dawn in the spinaway. You know, as an apprentice, a grade one. I go out in the third race on Creme de la Fette, crashed at the top of the stretch, woke up in the hospital a couple hours later. What happened? Don't know where I am. And five of the horses I was named on, including before dawn, won over the next couple of days while I was in Saratoga Hospital. Angel eked me out by one. Unbelievable. And yeah. you say Creme de la Fette. I trained Creme de la Fette. Frank Martin trained Creme de la Fette. Yeah. He won, he's one of the most amazing horses ever. He won races for 11 different trainers. It's Cannon Royal between horses. Here comes Spy Game. Four of them across the track. Spy Game now takes the lead. Storm Warrior and Creme de la Fette on the far outside. Creme de la Fette gains the lead. I won 16 races on that horse. Wow. I, you know, from the time I was an apprentice through my journey, you know, he was something else. He that totally horse tired. outlasted a lot of people in this game. <laughs> he certainly he was. A, he was amazing. One one thing, I I know that your career came to an end because of injuries, and I don't think our audience understands what a dangerous dangerous business this can be. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Well, yeah. I mean, you, you know, one thing you accept as a rider, and and it is a dangerous game. Um, it's it's not if you're going to get hurt, it's, it's when and how bad. And my first really bad injury, like jockeys break collarbones, it's not even a big deal. You know, you, you're out a month and you get back on the horse. But my first real bad injury, I broke my neck the first time in 1988, which they actually did a Rescue 911 episode on. Um, you can go to YouTube and put in Iron Jockey and that whole thing comes up. In horse racing, the stakes are so high, you often have to dare to risk it all, to dare to be great. On May 30th, 1988, nine races were scheduled at Belmont Park Raceway in New York, featuring top jockeys from around the country. And they really didn't think I was ever going to walk again. And I spent 
a month and a half in uh, LIJ, Long Island Jewish Hospital, and then a month and a half at a rehabilitation hospital learning to walk again, and then rode three and a half months after that, and got back right in it. When you're young, you think you're indestructible. You're like, well, it didn't phase me really. And then flash forward, I had several other bad injuries, uh, notably snapped my forearm in Belmont. I went down, a horse stepped on me. And I had three surgeries, still have two plates, 16 screws in my arm. But then the one that ended my career, I broke my neck again. And because I had the surgery previous and it was all fused, the x-rays were misread because I split right down the fusion, the middle of the fusion. I actually went back to riding and I was in agony. And the last day I rode, I, I had five mounts. I won with four of them. Couldn't drive myself home. My son had to drive me home. My wife took me to Mount Sinai Hospital that Monday. We got an appointment with Andrew Hecht, spinal uh, specialist. And he did all the images, and he works for the NFL and the NHL. And come in my office. He goes, I see what's wrong with you. I got, I got a pinched nerve, right? He goes, no, you got eight broken vertebrae. He says, you got six in your neck, two in your back. And I'm stunned. My wife starts crying. I said, well, doc. I've been riding like this. I ride a really good filly Saturday in Chicago named Life at 10. I just won that affectionately on her. She's easy to ride. You put her on the lead. I'll go ride her and then I'll come back and check in. You can do the surgery. Said, You're not leaving here today. She says, this thing's going to go. It's going to go like a light switch. She goes, this, the, your body's telling you everything's breaking down. You're going to be a quadriplegic. They put me in a collar, put me in a wheelchair, wheeled me across to the hospital section, checked me in. Had the surgery three days later, and that was the career. <laughs> wow. No big surprise why we're here. Um, my career as a jockey is over, um, not by choice. Um, in the doctor's office, Dr. Heck's office, on the Wednesday of last week, um, he assured me that I would never ride uh, another thoroughbred again. You rebounded once again, and your your uh, ra a personality working for Fox, working for Naira, uh, handicapper. I mean, <laughs> jack of all trades. I see you at the Fazek Tipton sales. I mean, uh, we we really appreciate having you uh, on on that team. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I you know listen, I'm blessed. I've gotten great opportunities. Uh, the day I went to Belmont and announced my retirement, it it, it kind of really hit me in the face, you know, because. From the time you're 12, you're dreaming of doing something and working towards it. By the time you're 16, you're doing it. Now you're 44 and it's over. And it really hit me like, who am I now? Uh, you, you know, I, I, and obviously most important roles in life, father, husband. But when you've done this your entire adult life, I really kind of had that thought, who am I now? I don't even know who I am anymore. And I got home and I was feeling pretty down about it. And before I left the track, Charlie Haywood grabbed me and said, you know, you really spoke very well up there. And I didn't have notes. I just talked from the heart. He says, when you feel better, call me. He says, I want you on our team. So that was already one positive reinforcement. I get home, Amy Zimmerman calls me from HRTV. We think you'd be good on TV. I went, why? Like, I don't know why. And they wound up hiring me. And I went to work for HRTV. And then I went to work for Naira. And I was able to do both. And... Again, just wonderful opportunities. And one thing about me, and, and, and you're very similar. We love this game. We're passionate about it. And I think if you bring that passion, whatever you do, it's going to shine through. I agree. And I, I really appreciate you bringing that passion to this interview because this has been great. And uh, it's nice to get a little insight into your life. And we jammed about 30 years of Richard <laughs> Migliori into the last 15 minutes. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Gary. Gary Contessa with Capital OTB with Richard Migliori. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.